Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. So, I just got two years of sobriety. Um, well, I guess not just, like, it was like a month ago. Um, and this is not my first time in the rodeo. I had a year, and I went out for a adventurous weekend, <laughs> and I came right back. Um, so, I'll do just a quick what it was like, what happened, what it's like now. I'm originally from Los Angeles, um, and I grew up with a single mom. Uh, it wasn't until I got older that I realized, like, my childhood wasn't the normal. Um, I don't know, in high school, I started drinking. I was, like, 13 or 14. Started drinking, quickly started doing drugs, um, and then quickly started having arrangements with older men to get said drugs. <laughs> um, and I did that for a while. Um, I had this like double life. Like I was a straight A student and like class president and in a bunch of clubs. And then like outside of school, I had all my belongings in a duffel bag and I had to rely on like the kindness of friends and their families to have a place to sleep at night. Cause I couldn't go home and I was really angry and, um, I was really uncomfortable and I used drugs and alcohol to like not feel what I was feeling. Um, I didn't have like the resources or the language or the coping skill skills to like deal with what I was going through. Um, and I very quickly hated everyone in <laughs> Los Angeles. And that's a very big <laughs> County. <laughs> and, um, I, I knew like I suck at sports. I can't sing. I can't dance. And the only way I'm going to get out because I'm from, you know, East LA is like, if I get a scholarship to go to college. And so I applied to like 20 schools. I got into almost all of them and I picked mills because I came up to Oakland with, with some friends. And I saw that like, you can walk down the street and like smoke a blunt and no one like a cop is not going to stop you. And I was like, Oh cool. You can do whatever you want here. Um, and I, I pulled a geographic and I like didn't realize until I got sober that like I was the problem. Like LA wasn't the problem. It was me, my behavior, my thinking, how I was just a person. <laughs> like I was the problem. And, um, it was a quick downfall. Once I moved up here, I wasn't failing any of my classes yet, but, like, I wasn't getting good grades like I was used to. I was hanging out with the street kids over on Telegraph and People's Park, and I, you know, was doing sex work, and, like, I think sex work can be a great occupation if that's what you want, but, like, I was not being safe about it. You know, I did not know about the various resources that could have really helped me, um, and not just like health wise, but like setting boundaries. Like I didn't know any of that existed. So I was, I was putting myself in very dangerous situations. And, um, and like my wake up call was, I was sexually assaulted and it went on for like three weeks, like every single day. And I couldn't talk to anyone about it. Cause I thought that if I did, like he, like I couldn't, like I would die. And, um, that, made me realize that like, if I kept living the lifestyle I was living, I would one day get in the wrong car with the wrong guy. And my mom would get a phone call saying like, we found your daughter's body. And, um, and I didn't want that to happen. And I, um, was 51 50 and AA meeting went to the psych ward. And, um, I don't know, like I, I just heard the message of AA. I went up to the guy after the meeting and I asked him for numbers of women who could help me. And he gave me a few numbers. And when I left the psych ward, I called one of the women and she took me to a meeting and it was an old timers step meeting, step work meeting. 
(laughs) And I was like so self-absorbed. I thought everyone was like talking at me. Like they were working on the fifth step. And I was like, oh my God, everyone knows all the terrible things I've done. Like that's why they picked this step. Not because it's in order. (laughs) Because they knew I was coming. (laughs) <laughs> and, um, and I was even so dramatic. Like I left the meeting and found like a dark hallway to like cry in <laughs> and like hate myself. And, and I eventually got sober like a few months later. I like got sober, went to meetings, did the steps, got a sponsor, got friends. And, um, you know, you're going to have a lot of women. If you're a woman, you're going to have a lot of other women tell you like, be careful with the dudes here. And that's for a reason. Um, you know, like we are sick alcoholics, like all of us, regardless of gender, race, sexual orientation, like we have defects of character that we really need to work on. And relationships are great ways to like see yours and other people's. (laughs) And I found myself in this relationship that I felt like I couldn't get out of. And I was miserable and we were terrible to each other and I felt stuck and I was doing sex work to support us. And every morning I woke up and I felt like I couldn't breathe. And I felt like I didn't have a say in anything or a choice. Like it was just suffocating. And so I, um, had this trip to LA planned and I was going to go down for a week and my friend, who's an, another woman in these rooms, was also going to be there, and we were going to drive back together. And um, and I remember I woke up the day I relapsed, and I was like, I know what will get me out of this relationship. Instead of being like an adult and being like, hey, I don't want to be with you. I'm yeah. going to move out. No. I was like, I know what will get me out of this relationship that will still make me look like a victim mm. in some minute way, minuscule way. And like, I don't have to have that awkward conversation. And that was if I get plastered and do, like, any drug handed to me and don't know, like, if I slept with someone or not, like, I have no idea what happened, then he'd break up with me. And that's exactly what I did. And um, I remember, like, after a two-day bender, I woke up to, like, all of these missed calls and text messages and was just like, fuck this is going to be terrible to go back to. And if I didn't have that ride set up, I don't know if I would have came back to Oakland um, when I did. I, I honestly think I would have stayed in L.A. longer, and I don't know what would have happened to me. I came back, and I had a secretary meeting, <laughs> and that sucked to, like, raise my hand as a newcomer when I'm at the front. <laughs> it was pretty humbling experience, and... Um, minutes and I didn't have a place to live it was just like me and my cat like and a duffel bag like I felt like I was back in high school but so many women in these rooms like let me sleep on their couch for like two weeks a month you know until I can move back into the dorms and if it wasn't for their kindness and their love and support like I I wouldn't be the person I, that I am today you know like I I'm just forever grateful for that and um started working the steps uh with my same sponsor that I had before I relapsed and um I don't know like things just started getting better I started loving myself I got into therapy I started setting boundaries with like my family and my friends and I don't know like I could I now today can look at my reflection in the mirror and like not want to spit at it and I can talk about my past and have compassion for that, per- like for that person that I was. And, um, I eventually was able to stop doing sex work to support myself. I got a job at the harm reduction coalition and I do work that I love. Like I fell in love with that work. I get to help people like myself, like, you know, like I get to provide the help that I needed when I was out there, you know, and the way that I talk to my clients is the way I would have wanted to be talked to when I was out there, you know, like, and I, I had to remind myself, like, I would never talk to myself the way I talk to my clients, like ever, you know, like I would never say the things to my clients who are in the tender one that like, that I would say to myself. And, um, 
And so I've just been practicing like a lot of love and compassion for my past self. You know, like I feel like it's really easy to be like, oh, I was a terrible person. I was just a fucking junkie. And like, that's not helpful. You know, that's not, that doesn't help me grow. That just tears me down. And, um, and I took a little leave of absence from AA for a while. I wasn't really going to a lot of meetings. I wasn't doing step work and things didn't get terrible. I was just like complacent. I started to feel stuck again. You know, I didn't feel like I was going to drink or use. I just was bored. And I was like, I think I should start going back. And, and so I have been, I've been going to about four meetings a week. I've been working the steps with my sponsor again. We're working on anger and vulnerability, <laughs> which is an experience. <laughs> and I don't know, like being an AA has taught me how to get real comfortable with being uncomfortable because in order for myself, for me to grow, like I have to be uncomfortable. I have to talk about things I don't want to talk about. I have to build relationships with people when I want to isolate, you know, like I, I have to go outside when I like want to stay in my dark room and watch Netflix all day. I have to go to a meeting when like, that's the last thing I want to do. And I don't know, like AA has just helped me connect with people and help me be a better person. You know, like I, I'm right now what I'm working on is, um, you know, I got resentful at AA because I felt like we can be really judgmental. You know, I was seeing how people were talking about chronic relapsers or like the homeless people that come into the meeting because they want a fucking place to sit and like free cup of coffee. And that really pissed me off. It really made me mad because like we're all in this room and to ju like to judge someone in this room is like you being in prison and judging the motherfucker in the cell next to you. Like y'all both in the cell, <laughs> you know? And, and so what my sponsor is having me do now is like when I see that judgment to be like, okay, there's the judgment. I'm not going to judge that person because I am not any better than them and like, let it go. Mm -hmm. And letting go is really hard. <laughs> and so it's like a constant thing. And that I'm able to do like out in the world too. It's just like, okay, here's judgment. I'm just going to let it go. And the St. Francis prayer has helped me a lot, you know? And so I've been like reciting that in my head a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Like, you're going to hear this a lot that AA saved people's lives and like AA did save my life. You know, I, I'm actually happy with who I am and who I am becoming. Thank you. Wow. My name is Ronnie and I am an alcoholic and an addict. Oh, Ronnie, Ronnie, Ronnie. When, um, the secretary talked about going around the room and introducing yourselves and everybody said that they're an alcoholic. I thought to myself, well, maybe I shouldn't say that I'm also an addict. However, <laughs> my sobriety date and my clean date is May 28th, 1986. One day at a time. Uh, I hit my first treatment center. When I hit my first treatment center, probably, I don't know. I think my son was a year old when I hurt my, my first treatment center. And I was told at that treatment center that um, alcoholics and addicts or addicts and alcoholics should go to AA. And, and they also talk about how we, AA meetings, we don't talk too much about drugs and at, 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 at Narcotics Anonymous meetings, we don't talk too much about alcohol. However, I was 12-stepped into this pro program by a retired prison warden who helped me raise my sons when I was sober. And um, he told me that regardless if it's an AA meeting or an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, we're all on the same page to stay sober one day at a time. And it doesn't matter. And so... That when when I go to an Alcoholics Anonymous Anonymous meeting and I talk about my addiction to to narcotics, I feel comfortable. I mean, I don't uh, talk too long about it, but it's a major part of my story. Um, I started drinking probably 
when I was 14 or 15. And, uh, I mean, it, to me, it was like, that's what my family did. I was raised in a Latin home, staunch Catholic parents, you know, and I had seven brothers and six sisters, and everybody drank, you know, and I was one of the youngest ones at that time, and and it wasn't it wasn't unnatural or it wasn't abnormal for me to walk into my parents' living room or the, the kitchen or the dining room, and there was a bottle of whiskey. My father had a, no matter where we lived, he had a basement, and a basement underneath the basement, and he, he called it his, like, his bomb shelter, okay? And in that shelter, I noticed that there was always bottles of whiskey down there, besides other things like um, firearms and ammunition. <laughs> and he had, but he hadn't, he had the firearms and that locked up and the ammunition hidden. So the, the, there was a lot of kids and cousins. I mean, Latin families, we have a lot of cousins. <laughs> so he always had that, the, the, the ammunition hidden. And the reason that I bring that up is to just give you a little background about where I came from. Our story is disclosed in a general way what it used to be like, what happened, and what we are like now. And since I, my, my son asked me to come tonight and share, and, and um, I asked him how long I was going to talk. And he said uh, he thought maybe 30 or 40 minutes. And so that, that throws out our stories disclosed in a general way. I have to go a little bit, more, I have to go a little bit fucking deeper, so I'm going to do that. <laughs> um, I had a brother. One of my brothers, the majority of my brothers were like staunch military officers and they were like very successful. But I had two brothers who were like dope fiends and alcoholics, okay? I mean, the other ones were alcoholics, but they were functional and they hid it very, very well, okay? And so the one that didn't hide it so well was my brother Patrick. And when I was a little girl coming up in and um, then I was a teenager, and I started getting boobs, and, you know, just looking a little bit better, I guess, to his friends. Um, they all taught me a lot about men at that age, you know, 13, 14, 15. They taught me how to get what, what I wanted by displaying different emotions. Like, if I cried, I got what I wanted. If I pouted, I got what I wanted. <laughs> if I... Um, was sad or if I felt shameful and I needed a man's lap to sit on, you know, they were always there. I was always surrounded by men. So by displaying these different emotions with these different men, what it did for me was it gave me skills, you know, the skills <laughs> that I needed that I thought in this head and my sponsor, the one that was the, was the uh, retired prison warden would always tell me, Ronnie, your biggest problem is being between here and here, okay? So, like my head always told me that if I displayed a different emotion to these different men, I'd get exactly what I wanted. I'd get all the money I wanted. I'd get the homes I wanted. I'd get the booze I wanted. I'd get the drugs I wanted. I would get whatever I wanted. I had a sister who uh, was my oldest sister, and she was gorgeous, okay? She was like so beautiful. And she went through a couple of men in her life. And I remember when I was like 14 and 15 years old, she would call me in her bedroom and she'd say, come here, I want to talk to you because you need to learn a few things about life. And I would be, and I would, and I was kind of like a little tomboy coming up until I got to, you know, start developing and shit. And it was like, like she told me, she told me one day, she said, you know what? You come from a big family, and you have a very proud mother and a very proud father. And you're kind of good in school, but I can tell that you don't like it. But I'm going to tell you one thing right now. You're sitting on a gold mine. And I said, sitting on a gold mine? What does that mean? I mean, I was only 14 or 15. I didn't know what the hell that meant. And she said, do I really have to explain this to you, Ronnie? Come on. And I said, yeah, because I was more interested in being, when I was a tomboy, was going shooting marbles in the, you know, in the alleyways with the guys and getting in fights and shit. And so what she told me was, she said, 
you're sitting on a gold mine and you don't even know it. And when, and you, when you come and talk to me in another year, I'll show you how. So as time went on, I, you know, I would drink a little here and there. And then that year went by and it was time for me to learn how I was sitting on a gold mine. And my two sisters brought me in the bedroom and they pulled out a black bra and some black silk panties and they held them up and they said, you're sitting on a gold mine. And this is how, if you don't go to school because you hate school, this is how you can get money in life. So, you know, as time went on, you know, I, you know, I kind of still didn't know what they, what they meant. However, I didn't like school. I didn't get along in school. I was always getting in fights and always getting sus suspended and kicked out of school. And as a matter of fact, I, when I was going to Encinal High School in Alameda, I got kicked out four times for, for smoking pot in the bathroom and we used to stop by the store on the way to school and we'd buy these oranges and somebody would always have some vodka. So they'd get this thing and they'd, they'd squirt the, the vodka and the oranges and we would go out and smoke weed and, you know, suck on those oranges in, in, the, in the field, out in the, in the baseball field. So I got kicked out a lot. And, you know, I think what happened with me was, or I know, I, and, but I didn't know then, and I, and I didn't know until I hit the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous and the sponsor that was chosen for me walked, through the, walked me through these steps, you know. Mm -hmm. And when I worked step one, you know, I found out a lot about myself and about the unmanageability and why I did the things that I did when I was drinking and when I, and when I was using. And I found out the reasons why I turned to alcohol, drugs, money, and sex and men and not and not necessarily in that order you know i found out the reasons i did it and some of the reasons were, were because of the effects that the alcohol and drugs had upon me and so some reasons were like he talks about in the 12 by 12 you know it talks about how rebellion dogs are every step and i was sitting here thinking when i walked in this meeting how rebellion still dogs my every step because i refused to come and sit up <laughs> wanted to sit over there until it was time for me to come up. So I still have those character defects and, you know, it, 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 the shit happens. Yeah, um, I'm going to progress a little bit and move a little bit forward and talk to you about um, the disease of addiction and, and how it affected me and how... Um, how, it, how I hit my last bottom because I think it's really, really important. It may not be important to you, but it's important for me because I had a sponsor or sponsors in this program that taught me and told me that I needed to keep step one, like just keep it right here. Because if I don't keep it right here, clear in my head and be very transparent with self and a power greater than myself about step one, as Tony says, I'm drunk already. <laughs> <laughs> My addiction to drug alcohol and to drug to 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 narcotics. Um, I had a very I had a tort affair, and I'm not going to say that it was all bad because it wasn't bad. A lot of it was a lot of fun, and I ran, and I you know I. <laughs> I, I did it the way that I wanted to do it. I was totally in South Will, and I loved every freaking minute. And I don't think that I, for one minute, and I'm not even going to deny and look at myself and lie to myself and tell myself that, yes, Ronnie, you wanted to get clean and sober. Okay? Because Ronnie didn't want to get clean and sober. Ronnie wanted to stay loaded. I had no goals. I thought I had a lot of friends, but you know how that shit is with the friends that are out there. You don't really have friends. <laughs> you take from them, they take from you, and, and that's just, it's the cycle of addiction, and that's the way it is, okay? So, my addiction progressed to the point where I had a $300 a day heroin habit, and I was drinking at least probably a fifth of Jack a day. And I don't know how the hell I did this because I only weighed like about 80 pounds when I hit, when I, when I hit my second treatment center. 
I was at the point where I'm, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm jumping around a lot because this is what I do when I share a bit. It's like I had two sons. One is sitting right over there, and he was a baby, and my other, my oldest son. And I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't take care of them. I couldn't, you know, obviously, I couldn't take care of Ronnie, so how the hell was I going to take care of that? And <clears throat> I was to the point where I couldn't, <clears throat> excuse me, I couldn't get up in the morning without picking up the phone and calling the man or having my five-year-old son take care of the baby and tell him to go pick up the phone and call my drug dealer because I couldn't get out of bed and, and, and I couldn't even, I couldn't even get out of bed to pick, pick the little one up to change his diaper and feed him. The five-year-old had to do that. So those military brothers that I was talking about earlier, <clears throat> they planned an intervention because they love these boys and they love me, <clears throat> even though I thought in my head that, you know, I was unlovable. I, I didn't have... I, I knew that I knew that I had a problem with alcohol and drugs, and I knew that I was totally consumed with that total incomprehensible demoralization that it talks about in the book, and it was gripping me. It was gripping me so bad. I mean, I could I would take showers and take bubble baths and just to wash off the pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization because I hated myself. I hated what I was doing to me, and I hated what I was doing to those babies. But you could tell an alcoholic, an addict, something. It's a, you could talk, tell them some things, but you can't tell them much. I wouldn't listen to jack shit, all right? So my brothers came to me, and they told me that if I didn't get sober, or if I didn't do something about my life, they were going to take those babies. And I was like... Yeah, whatever, you know. You know how we do when we're out there? And um, they threatened me, and they threatened me, and they threatened me. So there was a family intervention, and I went into my first treatment center. And it was at Starting Point in Hayward. And there's a, a man that comes around the rooms. He mostly goes in between. His name is Michael S. I don't know if y'all know him. He's African-American. He's an awesome, awesome, awesome uh, guy. He, he... Was in starting. He was leaving starting point two, and I remember that the uh, the second night and the third night in treatment after they detoxed me, I had to go to a to a meeting. It was a candlelight meeting, and um, I went and I stood in the elevator, and he was in there. And man, did he look good! <laughs> and the first thing that came to my mind was, "Ooh, a dude, money, drugs." You know that that's what <laughs> my head was telling me. So I got in the elevator and I looked at him. I was like, I was so skinny and I was all wet. Just like, I, please. <laughs> and he just looked at me and I said, do we have to go to the, keep coming to these things? This is terrible. And he goes, yep, one day at a time. And from that time frame to today, this is what, 31 years later, we're the best of friends. You know, and the, the, this is how the program of Alcoholics Anonymous works. You know, one day at a time we stay sober. I got out of that treatment center and I was probably dry for about 30 days. And I knew, I didn't want to stay sober. So I, I go to this meeting in Alameda and, and it was on Park Street when the meetings were on Park Street. And you had to walk up about 20 or 30 steps to get to the meeting. And I thought, you know, there's too many stairs. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I did it about three times, four times. Maybe, maybe I stayed sober three months. I don't know. Or dry three months. And I said, now this is not going to work. I go, to, I go to, this, to this concert. I go to this concert with my niece, who's like a teenager. And I'm getting to be, a, you know, I'm his mama, okay? And so I, you know, I'm at this at this concert, the Santana concert, and they're smoking weed and and, and they're drinking booze and and and, and, this, and the 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 blunt comes in front of me and it was like nothing. I just took it, and I went out there for three more years. I was out for three year, three more years, and everything that happens to an alcoholic woman happened. Everything. I thought I was all hips looking cool. Okay, I ran with men. I I 
flew around the country with all these different politicians, but I didn't think I was no ho. I mean, I wasn't, you know, I was flying around. I wasn't walking the streets. I was in a, you know, I was in a big jet. <laughs> I wasn't, you know, walking around being with guys for 20 bucks. There's no way. That's, that wasn't happening here. <laughs> you had to have some greed on you before I even got in that aircraft. <laughs> but you know what? Ha- you know what happened? You know what happened? That lasted for a couple more years, and I hit this this bottom that was insane, man. This insane, insane narcotic alcoholic bottom that was insane. And I go to my second treatment center. And there's women in there who are, were on the streets, and they heard my story, and they heard my hips looking cool talk about I was in jets. They looked at me and said, bitch, <laughs> you were doing the same thing we were doing, and you need to get real with self. <laughs> <laughs> you are no different than we are. And those women were absolutely freaking right. They taught me that I did not have to pick up a drink or a drug one day at a time. They taught me how to walk. They taught me how to walk right because, you know, they taught me how to dress. I used to run around the shit that was all the way up here. I mean, I was, it was a mess. I was a hot mess. I was a total hot mess. And these women taught me. They taught me how to speak, how to walk, how to interact, how to be a lady. I didn't know anything about being a lady. I, I loved your story. <laughs> I didn't know anything about being a lady. And I certainly didn't have any goals. But I kept coming back one day at a time because this retired warden from Boston and his wife <laughs> took me by my fucking hand and walked me through each and every one of those steps. And they didn't let me just play around with one word answers. Oh, yeah, I'm Ronnie, and I'm an alcoholic. And that's all I want to talk about. Bullshit. I mean, I had to write, and I had to get into service. I mean, service in prisons, and I, I had to do all those things. And I've been able to stay sober one day at a time since that time frame. And, and you know what? The, 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 the biggest part of me... And the biggest part for Al- in Alcoholics Anonymous for me is a power greater than myself. It talks about how we were alcoholic and could not manage our own lives. It talks about how no human power could have relieved our alcoholism and how good God could and would if he were sought. And that's what I have to do on a daily basis because I do not want to go back to that darkness, to those dark corners of my mind and the neg- negativity and the, and, and, and the cycle of addiction. Alcohol, Alcoholics Anonymous and alcoholic alcohol is a family disease. Mm-hmm. I have two sons who are both, one is dry, <laughs> but the other is sober today. You know, I have a granddaughter who can't seem to get sober, but she's only 16 years old, and nobody could tell me shit when I was 16. <laughs> And that's what I have to do when I when I interact with her. I have to treat her like she's a newcomer. I can't judge her. I can't say, well, man, that little girl, she needs to get her shit together. <laughs> I didn't have my shit together when I was 16. I didn't have my shit together for many, many years. I didn't have to get my shit together until he was two or three years old. So when it comes to the newcomers that walk in the doors, especially if they're women, for me, because I'm obviously not going to work with men, because we know both know where that gets this girl. <laughs> <laughs> so when I interact with the new uh, and the newcomer that's a female, and she's 16, 25, 30, 35, 45, 55, whatever age she is, there is no judgment. There's only love, and there's only the hand of AA that has reached out to her. Because if I don't have that, like Tony says, 
I'm drunk already. I don't know if I've talked I've talked too long. I do know this though. I do know that the, the the twelve by twelve and the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and each and every one of you that are sitting out there, you are a part of me. We are all brothers and sisters on the same page about staying sober one day at a time. Because that's what it is. I mean, I can talk about, I hear people talk in the room, go, well, I have 40 years of sobriety, and I have this, and I have that. Not me, I only have today. And the only reason that I told you that I want my sobriety date is because that's the way I was trained. When I walked into the room, my sponsor used to say, you start with your sobriety date. And he says, and if you're reluctant to go into that room, you remember that everyone on the other side of that door is an alcoholic just like you. And what that does for me, it puts me on an even playing with y'all. Because all of us are alcoholics, just like when you know we're, we're, we have that in common. And nobody is better than anybody else. I don't care what your color is, because what your you know sexual orientation is, what your national origin, origin, your race, your creed, whatever, your religion, whatever it is. We're all alcoholics. That little yellow card, the, top, the I am responsible card. You know, there's one thing that I, uh, ten, oh, 10 minutes. Okay, there's one um, I was leaving out. You know, I've had a lot of fun in sobriety. I had been married. Y'all want to guess how many times? <laughs> <laughs> All together, I've been married four times. One time when I was out there at three of sobriety. <laughs> so what does that tell you? It ta- well, I know what it tells me, and I know what it's revealed about me is that I have character defects and I have to work on them one day. <laughs> Step six is all about separating the boys from the men and the women from the girls, right? Well, when it came to step six, I, six, I was working it, but I guess I wasn't really working it that hard. Because, you know, my marriages and sobriety have all been, been, been adventures. They've been experiences, and they've been very learning experiences, okay? Um, my, my marriage to Jimmy K., he had two more years of me, and he passed away like um, nine years ago. And that shook me like nothing has ever shaken me. My sister Teresa, who was who was like my a mother to me, she passed away. I don't know, like it, it's going to be a year on July second. And when it comes to loss and sobriety, I don't know if I have just become numb, or I have accepted the fact that it's part of life. Because I have an, a way that I grieve, and then I go to gratitude. Because gratitude is, for me, is appreciating the relationship that I have with that person. And being, to, being able to show up for women in recovery that who are going through loss themselves. And, be, and, 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 and talking about not picking up that drink no matter what to drag my ass to a meeting if I get to that place where I feel like I'm just going to die if I, you know, if I don't have a drink. Alcohol, I don't really think about it that much. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't dwell on it. When I think about it, it's like I think it all the way through. I think like I was taught. You know, if you cut, if you're, if you come around here enough, and you ha- you stick with the winners, and you hang around with a lot of old timers, they'll teach you how to walk through shit, and how to walk through the desire to drink, how to walk through obsession and the compulsion, how to walk and read the doctor's opinion and tear it up and read the read about the phenomenon phenomenon of craving. I had a sponsor that had me do a. Um, an assignment on on the doctor's opinion and how many times the phenomenon of craving showed up in that book. And every time I had a count each time and it comes up 58 times. And I, every time that it came up, I had to write a story about it. How, how that craving got to me and, and what I did with that craving. And I still do that today. Because for me, I don't know about you, but I'm 
done with alcohol. I am done with narcotics because I know where it takes me and I don't want to lose my family. And I, oh, the be- one of the best things, you, you know what recovery has given me? Recovery, recovery has given me, when it talks about the promises, recovery has given me a career that far exceeds my wildest dreams and expectations. And this is coming from a little Latin girl that was rebellious to the core, that never wanted to go to school, and didn't go to school. I mean, I did a little bit, but not really. And I have a career work, working for one of um a high-profile uh, agency, federal agency, and I have, I'm, <laughs> I'm doing uh, drone oversight for all the airmen out there, or, or, or ones that are aren't airmen that remote remote that have to get a remote pilot certificate to fly a drone. We're doing studies now about that in regards to because the traffic, they're inter- trying to intercept with aircraft, and it's getting really crazy. And I'm on one of the committees for that. I do pilot deviations, and I and I do certification for 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 foreign pilots and other types of pilots and commercial pilots, et cetera, et cetera. I'm I'm, I'm the second lead this for 2017 Fleet Week. Guess how that happened? It didn't happen because of this girl's dreams, wildest dreams and expectations. It happened because I stuck around and because I have a power greater than myself who is bigger and better than alcohol and narcotics. And I kept coming back one day at a time. And I'm done. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.